Hello, and welcome to the Self Sufficient Hub podcast. I'm Carl from selfsufficienthub.com, and I'm here to talk about all things self sufficiency, sustainability, and food security matters. Hello everyone and welcome to episode 165 of the Self-Sufficient Hub podcast. I hope you're all safe and well. Today we're going to be talking about four things to get done before the end of March. Now this is something I started doing last month and I think I'm going to try and do it every month from here on out and in about five months time what I'm also going to do is I'll put a little reminder at the start of this episode where you can find the opposite sort of season episode for those of you in the southern hemisphere so today I'm going to be talking about four things to do before the end of March if you're in the northern hemisphere and as always you know I live in the UK so I'm talking about my climate and the temperate weather that we have here so obviously you may have to adjust things slightly if you live in a more tropical area so Before we get into that, I just wanted to catch you up with a couple of things that have been going on around the house. We've been absolutely flat out lately with spring starting to spring on and off. I've recently put some really early potatoes in and then uh, (laughs) instantly we had three really hard frosts, but they don't worry me too much. I think I'm okay because I've put lots of protection in place for that. It's a bit of an experiment, but I'm also fairly confident that I'm going to get some super early potatoes this year. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to have an oddments episode next week, next Friday, I think, which will get you guys all caught up properly we've got lots of news because hopefully by then we will have some baby goats we're expecting them on well the earliest maybe on Saturday we've had a a vet visit we've had all sorts of things going on here if you don't follow my YouTube channel then you won't uh, you know be up to date with all of that stuff but I will get you all caught up next Friday right Let's get into today's episode. So four things to do before the end of March. Now, again, I started this last month in February and my goal for this sort of set of episodes, one a month, is twofold, really. One, it's to remind us all the the things that we should be doing. But also, I think that these four things to do before the end of the month episodes could really, really help some people just starting out. I'm going to try and choose things that we can all do. So they're kind of based around working at any scale. So even if you've just got a very, very small garden and you know, most of the growing you're doing is in containers, then, and and if you're just starting out, then these are four things that you can do. And I'd like to think that if you were to create a little list every month of these things, and you do get them done, if you tick these things off and get them done before the end of the month, then I'd like to think that you will see, you know, a noticeable difference in how much of your food you're able to produce this year. So let's see. And please do give me feedback let me know how you get on whether they've helped whether they've made a difference or not and like I say they're aimed at being able to be used by anyone even the novice however I do also think that people who do this you know and have done this for quite some time and do this dedicate quite a bit of their life to it will also benefit by checking off these things because they're things that even though we might know about we don't necessarily always get around to actually doing So the first one on today's list is weeds. And what you want to do before the end of March is to have gone round and basically anywhere that you don't want weeds, just deal with them, you know, get that problem dealt with. March, the weather's started to warm up, the daylight hours are getting slightly longer and 
just like we're thinking about sowing all our crops now, all our plants and the tides turning, well, the natural world is thinking the same thing. And all of your weeds out there are really going to be kicking into gear. And of course, because they're weeds, you know, the nature of them means that they're going to be thriving in slightly less tolerant conditions than some of our other plants might like. So they're going to have a head start. So you've got annuals or perennials. Now, your annuals are slightly easier to deal with some of them hopefully if they've not gone to seed then you can just not worry too much about them you know almost just chop and drop them and use them as mulch but if they've gone to seed then you're going to want to remove them from that bed to make sure that you cut them and get rid of them these are your annuals if you're talking about perennials then you want to actually get in there whether it's with a big garden fork or just with a hand fork in my experience you know the 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 way that we garden here and it's not the same as everyone but because we use no dig gardening obviously we're not taking big garden forks into our beds we just use a hand fork but any perennials you're going to want to get out and get as much of the root out as you can it's really easy for you to get in touch with us you can do it either by sending an email to selfsufficientcontact at gmail.com or by using the link in the show notes to send us a voice message. You can send us a voice message just using your phone. You could also reach out to us on Facebook where we have the Self Sufficient Hub group and the Self Sufficient Hub page. We're always thrilled to get your feedback, questions or suggestions for future topics on the show. So depending on how far along your bed is, you know, if you're forming new beds or if you're if you have a bed that you're not looking to plant in just yet, you can control all your weeds just by putting some cardboard down that will uh, get rid of a lot of them. Again, it's going to depend on the type of weed, you know, how noxious, how persistent they are. Another thing to bear in mind, you know, if you've got some nice dry weather and we're getting some intermittent dry weather at the moment, then you can obviously hoe. You want to be careful about hoeing when it's really damp and wet out there because things can just reroute, you know, take hold that little bit easier. And again, just be conscious about what type of weeds it is that you're taking out. You know, if you're dealing with something like bindweed, then you don't really want to hoe that because every piece that you chop up is just going to be another plant that's going to try and take hold. So try and be aware of what it is you're dealing with. And if in doubt, just take it out, you know, the whole thing. So that's number one on our four before the end of March. And that is to weed. And obviously this counts as well. You know, even if you are growing in containers, you know, containers still get weeds and things are going to really take hold quite fast this time of year and it's so much easier to deal with them now nice and early the second thing on our four things to do before the end of march is to mulch now again we're talking about our annual vegetable be vegetable beds here and you know the best way to improve the soil not only in our annual vegetables but also anywhere else if you've got an established border even a flower border you know the best way to improve that soil is to mulch it and to mulch it with lots and lots of organic matter now it sometimes is easier said than done to produce all the compost that we need so you might want to buy something in but you don't need to just use compost you know you can use all sorts of things be it chop and drop manure or chop and drop style green manures that you're even bringing from somewhere else in the garden you can use wood chip. We've used wood chip really effectively in the past. And one of the ways that we've sourced it is by the utilities companies when they come and trim the trees around the power lines. When Whenever you see them doing that near your house, make sure you let them know that you're quite happy for them to dump that wood chip on your property because they are grateful for somewhere local to drop it. And you are going to get hold of this amazing free resource. So anything that is organic material is going to be a really good soil conditioner. And obviously, depending on what you add, is going to depend on how long it takes to break down but of course you can buy compost you can buy bark chippings anything like that to mulch these areas now this is going to work in tandem with our weeding as well it's going to help to suppress those weeds so that's definitely always worth thinking about 
Another thing to think about if you don't own one is the idea of maybe getting a garden shredder if you think that's something you'll make some use out of so that you can make your own wood chip, your own mulches for your surfaces. Now, again, like I say, we're talking predominantly about our vegetable bed, but also any other beds that you have, you know, by adding some mulch to them, you're going to be you know, doing lots and lots of good things for your garden going forward. We've already spoke about how it helps to improve the soil and how it helps to suppress weeds. But the other thing it does is it helps moisture retention in that soil when you get really hot days, which I know some of us, <laughs> at least I certainly would love some really nice long hot days. But even if we're not experiencing them yet, you know, they will be coming in the summer. And if you've got a lovely mulched piece of ground then that soil isn't going to dry out as quickly so it's also not going to suffer from rainwater runoff you know and washing away some of your soil so it serves so many amazing amazing purposes I just think mulching is so important and make sure that you if you can have mulched your beds before the end of March. Now, this isn't a separate item, but while we're st talking about mulch, I will just say that it's probably worth as well, particularly if you've got a bigger space, just having a think now, if you're struggling, if you're looking around and you're struggling to mulch your bed for whatever reason, maybe have a little think now and try to put the start of a plan in place that means you wouldn't necessarily have the same problems the following year so if you're struggling to create enough compost if you're struggling to procure enough materials to make enough compost then you know start thinking about that now for next year because it's always a long process to collect and make your own compost so if you're going to want to load next year you want to start thinking about it now because if you wait until the winter it really is too late and the only option you'll have is to buy it so that is number two to mulch your beds mulch your surfaces and if you are again using just a containers garden if you're only using containers then the same applies if you've grown in those containers last year and you're talking about annual vegetables then top them up as well just like you would a much larger space <music> Okay, number three on our list of four things to do before the end of March, and that is to get on top of slugs. Now, just like weeds, slugs are also thinking that now is go time. They're seeing lots and lots of greenery come out. They're seeing lots and lots of slightly warmer weather, but still damp. And it is just the perfect environment for them to get a kickstart on the year. They breed at a tremendous rate. And if you're not careful, if you are... If you are having a habitat that is perfect for slugs and we're not doing anything to temper that, then you could have a big slug problem by the time you get your seedlings out. And we all know that feeling when we've planted out something. We've planted out a load of cabbages or something that really is gourmet food for slugs and we come out the following morning and they've just destroyed the whole row. And there's not a lot more disheartening than seeing something that you've put a lot of time and effort into just destroyed overnight so now really is a really good time to get on top of your slug problem now I've done an entire episode on dealing with slugs so please do go back and check that one out but some of the things you can do are to literally go out by hand and just make sure that you're picking up any that you see now particularly if you go out after some rain that's the best time to catch them but again if you mulch you're going to find that depending on what you mulch with you know that's going to be a good way of really keeping slug numbers in check because they're not going to want to move around on lots of the mulches that we might use now you might choose to use slug pellets now there are organic options available that use a uh, ferric phosphate i think is the active ingredient rather than uh, 
methaldehyde. And these, in my experience, we don't tend to use them, but we have used them in the past and they are just as effective as the non-organic ones. So even if you're umming and ahhing and you're not sure, you know, if you're not an organic gardener, I would still say, you know, you may as well use them because, in my opinion, they're just as effective. I know that sometimes non-organic gardeners think that the organic versions are not as effective and that may or may not be true. I don't really know across the board. It's not something I know a tremendous amount about. But uh, I know that the organic slug pellets are super effective. So if that's the way you want to go, then now's the time to get some out just to keep on track of those numbers you know keep those numbers in check but there are lots of other ways that we can sort of keep our slug numbers in check and using animals is a great one if you've got ducks or chickens having them have a little bit of ranging on your vegetable bed right now before you're planting things out you know if you've got some spare spaces on it using a small chicken tractor type affair so basically like a, a chicken run that is movable that you can put on your vegetable bed on whichever parts of it aren't planted at the moment and allow your chickens or better still ducks to have at it and get rid of some of those pests for you before you go and plant out i know that at the moment we're struggling here in the uk with chicken lockdown we are in a avian influenza prevention zone and we've got all sorts of restrictions so we can't allow our chickens and ducks to just free range and take care of them for us we do have to have them in some kind of enclosed area like a chicken tractor but if you are not facing the sort of restrictions we are then of course you can just free range your birds over that space and let them get on top of it that way Another thing I mention quite often is to have some water near your vegetable bed. And, and I, when I say water, I'm talking about, you know, a, a pond or a small water body that is good for amphibians. Because to encourage those amphibians in and around your vegetable bed is only ever a good thing. Because those, again, are going to eat lots of those pests that you don't want, particularly slugs. Another natural option is nematodes. You can get nematodes that will actually, you know, destroy your slug numbers and you can introduce them, these living nematode worms, to your vegetable gardens. You can buy them online and just add them, you know, pour them into your soil basically and they will take care of it. Another option is beer traps. Beer is really, really strongly attractive to slugs and snails. So if you have a deep saucer that you fill up with beer, then you'll go out in the morning and you will find your slugs and snails have drowned in it. So once that's happened, you can, of course, just pick them out and feed them to your hens or throw them on the compost pile. But uh, either way, that's another great option for keeping your slug numbers in check. You can now support the show directly. Just go to patreon.com forward slash self-sufficient hub. You can become a patron and set up to donate to the show from any amount. Pledging as little as $3 a month makes a huge difference. If that's not your thing, you can also support the show by sharing it with people you know or posting about it on social media. We really appreciate all the help that you give us. It's people like you that make this show possible. And finally, the last on our list of four things to do before the end of March is to plant something. Of course it is. Now, it's not quite full steam ahead yet in March, at least not here in the UK. There are lots of things that we are certainly not going to be going and direct sowing out in our gardens. But there are lots and lots of things that we can be planting. So outside, you know, we can direct sow things like broad beans and lots of our really hardy veg. We can also be sowing in seed trays or modules so much more. You know, almost everything can be sown inside at the moment. So certainly things like peas and beetroot and lettuce can all be sown in trays inside, ready to transplant out when they're a little bit bigger. We can even be planting onion sets and direct sowing spinach, you know, directly into our gardens. And we should 
definitely now, if we've got indoor growing space like a greenhouse or a polytunnel that we're going to be growing things like tomatoes and peppers in, we should definitely be thinking about starting them off now and certainly by the end of March to start putting your tomato seeds in some compost. And whether you're doing that on a windowsill or somewhere else, if you're going to be transplanting them into a greenhouse, then you definitely want to be starting those before the end of March. Now, as you'll know, I am a huge advocate for attempting a few things outside those safe windows. So this is no different. You know, I think that what have you got to lose if you want to try a few things earlier as well? Because you never know if you're talking about things that you're going to be planting out in two to three weeks, then we don't know what the weather's going to be doing in two to three weeks. And we may well find that we get a really warm or mild mid and end of spring so why not be in a position to take advantage of that if it happens and to be in that position we want to just take a few risks you know and sow some things a bit earlier than you otherwise might for example I have got lots of potatoes out now. I have put some potatoes that I'm going to grow in buckets. So I've got some buckets with compost in and I've got a potato in each and I've got them in my polytunnel, which is obviously much earlier than you would normally do it. Same goes for outside. I've actually put some early potatoes outside and I've put row covers over them. Now, there's a chance that they will suffer with the temperature and that's okay because there's also a chance they won't and if they don't then I'm going to have a super early crop of potatoes at least two or three weeks earlier than I could reasonably expect to be harvesting them if I'd waited until I you know in inverted commas should should have planted them so I've I've put them in earlier than I should and I'm okay with that I'm okay with taking those risks because when it pays off I'm going to have extended my season considerably so I'm going to encourage you to take some risks as well and of course when it comes to planting things out really it's really difficult to give advice in terms of you know this is what you should be doing right now because when you look on the back of your seed packet it'll have a, a whole month either shaded in or not well it's not quite as simple as that as I'm sure most of you guys know but as I mentioned in last month's four to do the four to do before the end of February you know one of the jobs to do before the end of February was to kind of sit down and spend a minute thinking about your frost dates and your seeds and, you know, coming up with a bit of a timetable for planting them yourself. So you should all be ready to know what's ready to go in now and what's not. But, you know, don't be shy. Don't be scared to go a little bit early and don't be upset if you go early and it fails. That's OK. Some seeds are more expensive than others. So, you know, if you've got a really precious packet of seeds that only comes with six seeds in it, then I'm not going to suggest you do it with those. But lots of the things that we buy come in packets of hundreds or thousands, you know, particularly things like lettuce. You know, I, I think I bought a packet of lettuce seeds last year that had something like 2,000 seeds in. Well, I can very comfortably experiment with 10 or 20 lettuce and, you know, not worry too much if it doesn't pull off. I'm OK with that. So that's it. That's our four things to do before the end of March. So to run through them again quickly, weeding. Make sure that you've got on top of your weeds now because it's so much easier to do now and to keep them weak. And eventually, you know, you'll find that you're weeding less and less. But uh, having a good go at it now does make a difference and sets you up for a great season. Mulching. Mulch those vegetable beds or anywhere else that you're going to be planting annual vegetables. Deal with your slugs, you know, keep on top of those. And if you can do something now to reduce the numbers before they really start breeding heavily, then that's going to make a big difference going forwards. And finally, plant something. We're only halfway through the month of March. You've got half a month left. If you haven't already, try and make sure that you've planted something by the end of the month. And I hope that if you do all these things and 
when we get to April, you do the four things to do before the end of April and right through the year, I hope that you'll look back on the year and think, I'm really glad I did those. And at least some of them will pay you back in a way that otherwise you might have missed out on. So there you go. That's going to wrap it up for today. I'll be back on Monday with the final part of our permaculture principles series and after that who knows where we're going i haven't thought that far ahead we've got loads of fantastic interviews lined up so we'll obviously be bringing them to you on wednesdays and next friday will be an oddments episode where i'll get you all up to speed on the comings and goings here on my homestead and it's going to be a good one so i will look forward to speaking to you next week if you find this podcast valuable there's several ways you can support it the easiest of which is to rate and review it wherever you get your podcasts you could also talk about it or share it wherever you post online including your social media pages and now you can support the podcast directly by becoming a patron at patreon.com forward slash self-sufficient hub however you support the podcast We really appreciate it. Thank you for listening. See you soon.